Hey guys, I'm here at Giant Gorilla Greens in Woburn, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and I'm gonna give you guys a really great tour of their farm, so stay tuned. Hey guys, thanks for having me at the farm. I'm super excited to be here and, and see your farm. Um, but it'd be great to tell people kind of how you guys got started and uh, a little bit more about your farm. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much, Jonah, for coming down to Boston to see our farm. We're super excited to have you here. Uh, we've been talking to you uh, and consulting with you for a couple of years. So it's a really fantastic experience to have you here in person. Uh, my name is Smitha. I'm the co-founder of Giant Gorilla Greens. Uh, I'm Uday Ramakrishna, um, also co-founder of Giant Gorilla Greens. We started growing microgreens at home uh, just to support our lifestyle. We eat a mostly whole foods, plant-based diet. Um, and we do that to keep uh, my chronic condition in check. And um, Uday especially really likes growing food. Um, and he was the one who started growing microgreens. Uh, do you want to? Uh, my yeah. impetus is um, we live in Massachusetts. The growing cycle is so short and it takes eight months and then you figure you, you didn't do well. I like to fail fast and I figure microgreens is a quick crop to grow um, outside of their nutrient dense uh, quality. So that's why I got started and I think that's where the journey started. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I had a very similar start where I just wanted to grow something green and I, I gardened for a long time. And it's crazy how it turns from like, you know, just a hobby kind of passion into an actual business, which is really cool. And I'm excited to show everyone uh, the facility you guys have because it's it's really amazing. And honestly, the cleanest facility I've ever seen for a microgreens farm, which is really cool. But uh, yeah, we can walk through the process of how you guys grow. And uh, yeah, maybe let's start with uh, with the soil machine here. Absolutely. So tell me about kind of how you guys started using this machine. Like, I guess you guys would have originally started with just mixing soil by hand. Um, and then when you bought this machine and kind of more, more about, more about it. I mean, when we started, we, we used to use, um, soil that we bought at like Home Depot or Lowe's and they had so much of mulch in it that we had to like build this machine to see it then. Um, so we moved on to then getting a better soil that was prone to retain better water. Um, then this handmade tool was our best friend to kind of level <laughs> the soil by throwing it by hand. It was easy when we were doing 10 or 20 trays, but then when we started scaling up, it wasn't so much uh, fun anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Simita went and found this, this cool little machine. Yeah. Um, and it's been like a lifesaver for us. Yeah, definitely. I think it was very labor intensive, um, trying to break down a bale, uh, trying to mix fertilizer in without having any concentrated chunks of fertilizer. Uh, so this machine was, it, it literally saved our life. Um, and uh, now we're easily able to mix in, mix the soil and fertilizer. Um, and then it also fills our 10 by 20s. Um, so it's, it's a huge, huge time saver. Uh, it saves us doing a lot of like labor and sweating it out uh, out here, which we don't have to do anymore. Yeah, for sure. Soil mixing is definitely like really <laughs> intense. Thanks for like consulting with you, right? Um, we were using a liquid fertilizer that was more expensive. Um, and so we hadn't heard of the product, Gaia. So talking to you, we kind of figured that's a viable alternative. And that's yeah. how we got on using you know, a fertilizer that was not liquid yeah it kind of helps scale us across the business versus trying yeah. to do it selectively yeah for sure so how, how do you find the difference between the liquid fertilizer and and the Gaia green in terms of like yield and flavor and all that kind of stuff i believe that um it 
they're very very comparable the only crop that i would say probably did better on a liquid fertilizer might be something like arugula oh interesting uh, arugula is a problematic crop but i remember the only time we have we have had like a very fantastic flawless arugula crop was when we were using the liquid fertilizer interesting oh, okay yep Okay, cool. And but but you you're, you're generally using the the powdered fertilizer now. Yes. You find so it's it's easier to use. It's a lot easier, and there's no wastage. Like with the liquid fertilizer, you always run the risk of um, basically just throwing it down the yeah. drain once it's done, because uh, we don't have a recirculating system. Yeah. So this is a lot more efficient. Yeah, for sure. So in terms of in terms of this machine, so you put the soil. This lifts up. Yes. This okay. Works. So. So that kind of lifts up and then you put the bale. Oh, cool. So the bale sits on here. Uh, no, it, this it goes all the way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. You can turn it on if the yeah, auger like... will spin. Yeah. yeah it won't. It's, it's, a, it's a safety gate. Yeah. It won't turn on unless this is closed. Yeah. Um, do you want to give me some trays? We can like fill yeah. some trays. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So th this is like uh, it kind of it like gets the top layer of soil off this little spinner. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. It sounds so futuristic, like the <laughs> the like the electricity that's going through. That sounds really cool. Oh, nice. There you go. That's so that's how you make life a lot easier as a farmer. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So that, yeah, I can see why this is, you know, a lifesaver yep. for, you know, running a farm. The, the soil mixing was definitely one of the, um, one of the most tiring parts of, of yeah. running a microgreens farm. It, yeah. it, Having that machine must save you guys, not just time, but in terms of you get home and you're not so tired at the end of the day because like, you're not doing so much physical work. Yeah. Even though you're farming, it's still physical work. It's yeah. much less intense having a soil mixing machine. For sure. Uh, and this machine can do uh, like 600 trays an hour. Wow. So. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yep. Yeah. So you guys, you guys will be good for, for a while because that, that's, that's a lot of trays. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. So then, um, so then you, the first step is you seed the microgreens in, or sorry, you mix the soil in there. And then the next step would be seeding. Seeding, yep. Okay. Yep. So you have the trays and it looks like it, it did a really good job of evenly, um, like making like a flat, yeah, yep. spreading out the, the soil really well. Do you find it mixes really well, like the fertilizer, like it's perfect? Yeah, we here? haven't had any problems with mixing. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Fantastic. Awesome. So, so then the next step would be seeding, and yeah. it looks like you guys have a really well-organized system <laughs> with everything labeled. Yep. So th is this where you, you keep all the, all the seed? Uh, so we have some seed here, but most of it is uh, stored in a in a in a in a different room in a closet. Oh, okay, got it. Um, not that we're keeping it in a room that's slightly cooler. I think that would be ideal, having like a cooler room. Uh, but that's something we probably will plan for in the future. Yeah, yeah. I, I know um, they always say you should like keep like ideally keep it in a freezer. In my opinion, I think it's just not practical to keep it yeah. in a freezer because like. They, the most seeds last up to five years and there's only a few like sunflower onions that only last like one to three years but most seed last a long time so unless you're you know stocking up for the apocalypse i think you'll probably be okay with uh with keeping at room temperature yeah but but i know ideally you keep it in a cooler temperature but in my experience you don't really need to necessarily the yeah. only seed i would say we ran into an issue in all our time now is basil for some reason, it, it had some kind of uh, pests inside it. Interesting. So have, like, this falls back, um, and they sent us a new, a new batch of it. Um, but that was, and it was here for a while, but it just came out of order. Yeah. yeah, I think you mentioned that on the podcast. I did. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, interesting. Yeah, I've had um, uh, si something similar where there was uh, grain bugs. If you ever know what grain bugs are. 
um, we got it from um, a C company and there was these little uh, uh, bugs and I couldn't figure what they were. And I found out just researching online, they were grain bugs. So I think it was on, maybe it was like wheatgrass or something. Um, so they actually will eat the grain. So if you, and, and then it's, it was kind of unfortunate. It spread to oh. my kitchen at, at my house and I got grain bugs in like flour. And, and I didn't even know that this was a thing. And it's like, it's almost like, um, you know, they, like there was those moss that would eat your clothes back in the day. Yeah. That I didn't even, I thought it was a myth, but apparently it's, it's, you know, still a thing that exists. Yeah. Um, so it's the same thing. I didn't know that there was like this common bug that will yeah. eat your grains in, in, in the bags in your house. So anyway, yeah. side story, but um, yeah, it, I'm glad you got rid of that batch and got a new batch because yeah, yeah, you definitely don't yeah. want uh, live bugs in your seed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so definitely keeping an eye on the close eye on the seed is important because it was very... It was so tiny. You couldn't see it. You couldn't see the yeah. cups. Mm. Um, while I was looking at the cup in which we place it, is when I noticed that it was a cluster in one week. Because it was coming out of the seed and yeah. that's how we find something. Yeah. yeah. Is that why you guys have like most thing most of the bigger seeds stored in bins to kind of prevent anything from yeah. getting in? So, yeah. But it's yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So then when you do so do you do you seed once a week or multiple times a week? Uh, we do multiple times a week, um, oh, so, so it's based on a schedule. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like see, yeah, yeah, seeding. Yeah, seeding. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a chart. We seed like our biggest seeding day is Monday. Okay. Um, and then we seed through the week. It, but it's not like a lot. But on Monday is like our busiest like seeding day. Yeah. Yeah. And you you kind of do you weigh you? Oh, I see the scale there. So you weigh it. You weigh out each yeah. seed. They get the exact amount that you want. Yep. And then do you do you ever do you ever do that in advance, like on before, or you do it just the day of? We used to do it when we used to seed on the weekend. Uh, so we would measure everything on Friday so that if we are coming in on a Sunday to seed, we're not spending a lot of time in, in the office. Yeah. 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 But now you find it's manageable to, yeah. to kind of just do it all in one day. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um okay, and then how how many varieties do you grow here? Um I, we have like a lot of seeds, yeah. <laughs> but I think on a regular basis, we're probably doing no more than a dozen crops. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I find that really a lot of farms start out with like all the varieties in the world. Yeah. And then once you realize that like, there's only so many that have enough demand that it makes sense, yeah. then they narrow it down. I guess the exception is like some uh, farms that sell directly to restaurants. A lot of restaurants want like tons yeah. of variety, yeah. but most consumers and consumers of the product are only going to buy, you know, a handful of, of different products. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So um, we can get to the next part. So once, once they're seated um, on the trays, then the yeah. next thing would be to water them in and put them in the germination room. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing some seed prepping yep. now. So yep. You're doing something very interesting, which I've never seen before, is you have a 1020 tray on the scale and then you're weighing multiple multiple like trays worth of seed at once by just and then I guess what you're doing is you're just adding the you're just adding the cup each time and then you're getting you're putting the amount of seed and it's just whatever the seeding rate is, you just add that to the number yes. that's previously there. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's a really smart way to reduce the time in prepping to seed because normally people would just weigh one cup put that in spread it but doing things in groupings like this is a much smarter way to actually save time on seeding yeah 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 definitely I, like the 10 by 20 obviously you can do like so many cups on that like up to i think eight or ten um it was Uday's idea i want to give him credit for that <laughs> no it's really smart yeah i've never actually seen that done but that's a, that's a really smart way to do it Okay, and then, so you put a little bit of water on these trays to, to get them started. Yep. And you're seeding basil? Yes. Nice. Uh, interesting, so you guys do it different ways. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I found that, you know, a lot of people, I, I had the same thing where when I train staff on seeding, 
because um, we seeded pea shoots and sunflowers still by hand, and yeah. everything else was done with a seeding machine. But when people did the the uh, pea shoots and sunflower, they were all do it a little bit differently, which is very interesting. So it's cool to see that you guys, you know, have been doing this for a few years, and you're both doing a different way in uh, in seeding. Yeah, I started out with my hand, but I like you honestly. You get like your hand gets fatigued. Yeah, the cup is easier. I yeah. Think. Well, as long as it's evenly seated, and what, what I'm excited to show everyone the actual grow space because that's you know it's crazy how evenly, uh, you know, for seating by hand, how even the trays are. So you'll just water them in. And then they're good to go? Yep. Okay, awesome. So then they would go in the germination room. Take them both. Okay, so you have a grow tent for your germination, which is really cool. And you have, so obviously usually you'll, you'll have a lot more, but just because you guys are showing us yep. um, that uh, there's just the two basil there. So is this, you have this grow rack here um, in the tent and then you have more germination space over here. So is, yeah. is there a reason that the basil's going in this one? So this is stain afterwards, and then we try to keep basil separately from the other crops um, because we try to keep it more in um, It stays for longer duration. So yeah. Keep them white free. Yep. Okay, cool. And then uh, you're also not, you don't stack them in this one? Um, well, we tried doing the basil this way and we were hoping to have less, uh, you know, soil and things like stuck to the seed. Yeah. And I think it's working out all right for now where we basically just put them in the tent. Uh, the tent has like a bucket of water with a heating oh, element. Okay. So the tent stays humid. Um, and then... Four day, after four days, we open the tent and like things are already germinated. It doesn't really need like a top tray. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, uh, stacking basil, I found, doesn't seem to work well. Um, so I found that usually leaving it unstacked. But that's smart That because I guess, so you don't have to water it at all during the germination phase? Yeah, for those four days, we don't do anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. We do check on it. And if we think it needs like a little spray, spray it. Okay. And then this room is the main germination room. Yep. Yeah, these grow tents are, are such a great way to like save on building something. Because we took everything out today, but here yeah. is where we do like stack things and. Okay, yeah. cool. So you stack them for all the other crops you stack. For them. everything we stack. Okay, yeah. and then it's just for basil that you don't stack. Yep. Yeah. This is, yeah. yeah. And then do you, do you have to control humidity in here at all or just having it closed with the plants in there is enough? Yeah. 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 Just having it closed is like, it's pretty humid in there. Yeah, for sure. Cool. And then you guys just, yeah, I'm glad to see things like this. Like it's just a, uh, a germination tank cleaning log. Like you're just having yeah. those kind of things make yep. life a lot easier when you have staff. So you guys, you guys have some staff working here, right? That's uh, we have a part-time helper, but she mainly does like washing and sanitizing. Okay. Uh, so she doesn't really do the operations. So for the operations, we have uh, like SOPs. Yeah. We have like a daily checklist as well. Um, so the checklist is basically like a print of everything that you want to do like in priority. So like say it's like today's Tuesday. Yeah. So first priority is like watering everything, setting the fans because tomorrow is harvest day. Yeah. Um, so we have a checklist for each day. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, that's good. I'm, good you, I'm glad you guys have those SOPs because once you have more and more staff, it just makes training them so much easier. Yeah. And eventually you guys are going to be like too busy that yeah. like creating that while you're already so busy with, you know, ramping up production yeah. will make it even harder to work on those SOPs because you, yep. you have to spend that time focusing on production. So that's really smart. And then for now, I know you guys are getting a tray washer, which yeah. is really exciting. Um, but for, for now, you guys, after you, you wash them, you kind of just stack them on, on a rack here and let them dry. Yes. And then after well, like a day or so, they're ready to use again? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. And then um, 
And then, so once they come out of germination, which is, I guess, on a fixed schedule year round, same, everything's the same. Yeah, we have a checklist for that. Also, like on Monday, this is what comes out of germination on Tuesday. So that there's absolutely no confusion and you know exactly what's coming out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Perfect. Yep. Okay. And then once they come out of germination, you just, I guess you, these are multi-purpose. You can use these to wheel them. Yeah, we roll these over and like, it's easy having the tents here because you just basically like move them onto this and then roll them in and yeah. get everything on the flood trays. Um, Uday is actually building a system uh, to make this step easier as well. Do you want to like talk about that? Um, I mean, like you had suggested, we were thinking we could just use two by fours and build more of a group um, of germination room here so that all we do is we don't have to like, prepare, we bring it, we lift it, put it in and put weights instead of that, you just wheel the back in mm -hmm. and you're done with it. So one step gets cut. Oh, okay. So hoping that that will kind of reduce. Yeah. Some amount of work we have to do. It's yeah. not so modular and yeah. mobile, but I think that will kind of produce other overheads. Yeah. Oh, okay, so right now the racks in there, you have to t like physically lift, lift, lift them off. The stacks out. Um, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if you could do everything and bring it here and just push the racks in. Yeah. It's not made for that weight. So just yeah. building it probably is good. Yeah. Yeah, and you already have most most of a you know a wall here, or you have the insulation, so it'd be pretty easy yeah. to to do that. It's just some framing, and you could just use some six mil plastic, unless if you you can drywall it, uh, but it might get moisture issues. But yeah, there's there's lots of easy cheap options that are available for that. Okay, cool. And then so it comes out. So you you guys for now take it out by hand, but soon you'll just be able to wheel it, and yeah. then you come to and then you bring them to the grow area, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is the grow area, which is super cool. I think like, you know, the the setup is 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 really great. It's it's I would say semi automated, um, but they have some really cool things going on here and I'm excited to walk through with you guys the uh, the setup. So you're using uh you're using a uh a flood and drain system, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. So maybe I'll just do a quick walk through and you can see just how uniform the 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 crops are on the trays now those are a different um yep, age good. but all the crops i like the the little labels you have that makes it like a lot easier to identify, identify them, yeah, yeah what it is and yeah. and when it's from um but you can see it's super uniform and this is arugula which is you know a really tough crop to grow um and it's super super uniform and then um, things like over here, there's amaranth, which is a very tricky crop to grow, uh, and some radish on the other end, and it's super, super uniform. Um, but if you want to talk about the plumbing, um, I think the, <laughs> this is a very familiar system uh, with the plumbing. Um, but yeah, just like it, it looks great, and I'd love to hear about your experience with um, having like the, you know, setting up the packs and, and having the flood and drain versus watering by, by hand, which I'm guessing is how, is how you guys started. Yeah, I think back home we used to, we had a bucket and a, you know, jar system that was <laughs> filling each tray at a time. Uh, and I know we've got head cuts from all of that. Um, it was painful. I think back then we had decided we were going to do flood trays, but after talking to you, we kind of implemented this, which is get packs, um, have valves for each one of them. And then we also prepped it in such a way that tomorrow when automation comes in, we can just replace the pets yeah. with um, a, a solenoid in between that you can uh, control using software controls. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the next level where we can get to automation. But today what we do is we manually pretty much open and close the valves. So it just floods the whole system and then there's a drain yeah. that takes the water out yeah. um, to a big tank that we have. And only on days when we first bring this out, we try to ebb and flow, but otherwise it's all individually watered um, and drained out. When you say individually watered, like each level you mean? Each level yeah, is yeah. individually watered. So yeah. We don't carry any contamination yeah. across. Yeah. So we kind of keep it that way. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's smart to put the solenoids in here. This is a filter for the solenoids. 
um, so that when the time comes that you, you know, guys want to automate, um, it's ready to go. Like it, it's, you know, it's like a quick switch. You just switch out a few parts and you have an automated system, which is really great. But even still this, this setup saves so much time and it's something that, you know, really anyone can do. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it in your house, but once you have a commercial scale facility, it's, it just makes life so much easier. Um, you just turn a valve, you can go do other things, set a timer, come back and then, you know, uh, you know, have the, have the water going in the, in the background. It's, it's very easy when you have a clean these squares as well, that you can just drain the whole thing out and flood them up. Yeah. Uh, the tripping hazard, having the hole somewhere around, and it can also fall and flood this whole thing. So yeah, for sure. And you also, have, not having just the cleanest farm, but you also have the cleanest flood tables <laughs> I have ever seen. It's unbelievable. So I'm guessing you guys must have to clean them pretty often to keep them this pristine. <laughs> Every week that we harvest stuff, they get they get scrubbed down and then they get yep. uh, sanitized. Okay, nice. And then um, I see you have a few fans here, kind of um, on each level. Now, do you, do you have one per, it looks like one per every two. Oh, you have on the other side as well. So pretty much one per level is what is what you have going. And do you keep those on all the time just to move the air around? Yeah, yeah, they're on as long as there's um, trays in the flood tray, the fans stay on. Okay, nice. Do you, do you find that helps like with humidity or temperature? Or um, I think we've seen like moisture sitting on the leaves and I think that we don't want to see that for like a prolonged time. Yeah. It's going to create issues. So the fans are definitely helpful in keeping that down. For sure. Yep. Cool. And um, the, uh, the first of all, the crops look amazing. I can't get over how, <laughs> how nice. I'm so used to looking at purple light and when you have the white light, it just everything looks so beautiful. Like just the the purple and the red from the amaranth and the radish just look really really yeah, beautiful. Yeah, definitely those two are uh, very very beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and then in terms of lighting, so um, I was I was really impressed with the the lighting you guys are using. So you have one thing I think is really cool is these lights have spacers, so you can choose how far apart you want them, and then they they are held in place with these spacers, which is. So it's such a simple thing. It's just a piece of plastic, but it makes installing them a lot easier and then keeping them in place, right? Because you have, you have another set of lights that they kind of will move over time. We have the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then you don't really get the same even lighting. So with this, it solves that problem, which is really cool to see. So could you guys talk about the, like, it sounds like you guys have done a lot of testing with lighting. So I'd love to hear kind of where like the different lights you've used and your experience with them and what you kind of settled on to be the best grow lights um, that you're using for microgreens? Uh, so we started out with the Barina lights that are very, um, you know, cost friendly. We bought them on Amazon. Um, and then after we moved into this facility, uh, like this warehouse, we wanted to basically up our game a little bit. Um, and we tried to contact a lot of light manufacturers. I think that a lot of the lights are geared towards the cannabis industry. So it was a little bit of a struggle getting like good lights. Um, but then, you know, we found uh, these lights. These are fight, fight electric lights. Um, the fight electric lights, we bought them at Home Depot. Um, and we also bought uh, GE lights from Lowe's. So, you know, just your regular hardware store, uh, you know, you can go buy lights from there. We we bought some like kind LED lights as well. Uh, that's like they're made specifically for microgreens. And then we basically tested and compared all of them. Uh, and, you know, we figured out that, you know, some of them are giving us like fantastic yield. Some of them are giving us like fantastic colors. And so based on that, we decided which ones we want to choose. So we did Fight Electric, um, and then we have some GE lights as well. And both of them you can get at, like, any hardware store. Yeah, yeah. and and the uh, the Fight LED, there's a really cool feature that uh, they showed me earlier, which I, I'm excited to share with you. Um, the, uh, they actually, it's really cool. You can actually turn on and off the different spectrums just with a little switch. 
on a relatively inexpensive light. That's really cool. So you can do a lot of testing or uh, modifying depending on the crop you're growing. So you can choose to have more blue light, more red light. Um, and I think that's really, really smart in a, in a light like this, especially in the early phase of R&D to see what works best. Um, and what's also really cool is they're using much less power than what I've seen in the past to get really, really good results. Like the crops are, look really great. Like here we got some, uh, is this a mix? Salad. It's like a brassica mix. It's a salad. Yeah. yeah like it's... they look really, really healthy. And then here there's kohlrabi, which also looks great. And the, the leaves are a good size and the stems aren't super, super long. And here it looks like kale. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they look like really, really healthy and a really good size, which is a good indicator. If you have crops where the stems are really elongated, there's usually an indication you don't have enough light. Um, and then how many hours are you guys doing per day on the lights? Um, we, our lights come on at 2 p.m. and they stay on till 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Yep. So that's... 18 hours. 18 hours. Yep. Okay, cool. Nice. Um, and do, do you have like time of use here where they charge more for electricity certain times of the day or We no? don't have that. Okay. I wish we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they can save money. It just depends on your, on your location. Yeah. But um, yeah, everything looks super, super healthy. Like the basil looks really great and smells really great. And, uh, and even the cilantro, which is my personal favorite, looks really, really healthy. So, um, and then what is, is oh, cinnamon basil. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Is that used for, for restaurant clients? Um, we basically just uh, give it to a retail store. Uh, they have it as a separate product. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, that's pretty much the grow area. So once these are ready to harvest, so I guess how do you know what's ready to harvest is a, is a good question. So we have everything on like a specific cycle. So like the amaranth, for example, is on a 14-day cycle. Uh, most of the brassicas are on a nine-day cycle. They get harvested on the ninth day. Okay. Um, so we have uh, kind of everything planned out like on a spreadsheet. and. Um, so we basically, you know, if we want everything to be ready on Wednesday, we just come back from yeah. there. And, yeah. And yeah. then these little tags here that yeah. will say the date, these will indicate that's how you know when they're yeah. planted. And then you just count the amount of days to grow. And, you know, okay, the 1010 basil will be ready on what, whatever it is on sometime end of October. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. And after the crop is ready to, to harvest, then you... You take it to the harvest area, yes. which is over here. So maybe let's go over there. Yep. So we would usually, we would, uh, you know, tran like transfer all the trays onto one of these wheel racks yeah. and we would wheel them here. Okay, cool. And um, we have the quick cut greens harvester, which uh, this was one of, this was actually the first machine we bought. And this was after we consulted with you. Um, and this was a huge, huge time saver. Um, so this, we, we basically harvest everything on this table. There's a drill that goes here. And this um, machine definitely makes life a whole lot easier. Like I remember once um, uh, there was a retailer that wanted like, um, I think 100 plus boxes. Um, and that time I was the only one and I hand cut everything. Wow. Uh, and I remember working till like 10 p.m. that night by myself, like trying to pack 100 boxes after like hand cutting them. Uh, and I wish like I had, I had this machine back then. Um, so, yeah, th this is like the best thing according to me. Yeah. No, it's it's great. I'm glad you guys got one because it's it's I always tell people, you know, it's it's by far the best low cost option to harvest and to harvest by hand, even at a small scale, doesn't make sense. And then even just for the scenario you were in where yeah. it's, it's probably, it's worth it just for that one time when you have a big harvest, yeah. let alone to have it for many years. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you guys have it and you have the quick stand here. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do you attach it to the we table? Clamp. A clamp, okay. There's the orange. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Um, and we actually bought this while we were still in the house. Uh, so oh, we, nice. we used to have this in our basement. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then you, so you just clamp it down. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And then while you're doing that, I see you have these, I've seen a few of them where you have like a sticky trap yep. for, for bugs. So it looks like it's caught some stuff. Um, <laughs> so how, how do you find, um, do you, do you find, like, I know you, you said you had some kind of yep. pest issues uh, with fungus gnats in the past. Um, what kind of caused that to happen? And then how did you guys solve that? So we had issues when we were growing flowers. Uh, we used to grow sorrel and that's when we had a lot of like flies. Um, and we basically tried ourselves like putting those sticky traps, but then at some point we brought in a pest control person and they placed like these traps. You don't have to bring in a pest control person, but we have one in any case because our landlord wants us to have like a pest control plan. Yeah. Um, so these sticky traps basically took care of the situation. We don't need them anymore, but I think it still helps if there's like a random spider or, you know. Yeah. 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 It looks like it caught a, a little potato bug in there. Um, and yeah, like, like, you know, it, people think that you're growing indoors, you won't have any, any pests, but it's, it's just inevitable. You're going to have, you know, something pop up. Well, uh, recirculation from outside. So it is bound to come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, and you harvest everything with this? Yes. Okay, nice. Nice. Yes. We don't want to cut anything by hand. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. Is this the first one you've ever had? We have two of these. Okay. Um, we actually need to, we've been talking about getting another table so we can have two machines running at once. Yeah. We want to see if we can optimize the time, like even now, you know, uh, what we do right now is, you know, we, we have one machine running and then one of us is harvesting, one of us is packing. But I'm hoping that if we run both the machines, we can cut down our harvesting time even more. Yeah. Uh, so that's something we have to like, uh, basically get a table first. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. It's like the classic math problem. If you put two people to work at the same time, how many products can you use? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I've never actually seen that. So it'll be interesting to see what the results are if you guys end up doing that. Cause if you already have a second harvester, yeah. then it's just a matter of getting a table. Yeah. Um, and you guys are using stainless steel tables, which are great for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so then you would harvest the product. It ends up in this bin here. And then you put it directly into the, like, what's what's the next step that you guys we do? We have these, like, uh, plastic bins. Um, so everything is basically we uh, tip this basket into the bins. And then we weigh everything on uh, the scales. Um, and this is basically what the finished product would look like. Wow. Yeah, the, their packaging is just unbelievable. It's the, by far the nicest packaging I've seen for retail. And, and it's really cool because um, I'll just show that they have, for each crop, they have a different leaf shape in, in, uh, in built into the label, which I think is so cool and unique and, and really beautiful too. Um, so is this, this is the full product lineup? Uh, we have a few more that uh, I think are, yeah, we have, yeah. Uh, we have like 10, um, like retail schools right now. So 10 different labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, what's funny is <laughs> these scales here, yeah. um, they, they seem to be always looking like the ones that are, are meant for weighing product always look like they're from the past. Like to me that they are, like we, the ones we got too are from, they look like they're from the eighties, yeah. but they're, they're so expensive because they have to be, at least in, in Canada for, um, uh, they have to meet like measurement Canada standards. So I'm guessing it's the, it's the same here. Um, and then they, they, like the technology hasn't changed in probably like 30 years. Um, but they charge so much money for those scales and it just, I think it's funny that it's, it's like one of those things. Yeah. Bulky, like old televisions. Yeah. 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 And then the packaging, um, you guys have one size for most things, but then this house micro mix, you have two different sizes. So I'd love to hear kind of all oh, the broccoli, broccoli as well. There's two sizes. We have two sizes for most of the products. Um, but the larger boxes, that's D2C, that oh, okay. doesn't go to retail. Got it. Um, and then we also have half pound boxes that is only food service. Yep. But those don't, they don't have the same label. They have, we a, have like just a very basic yeah. label for those. Um, 
like just a yeah. square label uh, for the half pound um, for sure. food service boxes. Yeah, yeah. For, food, for food service, I find that you don't need a fancy label. It's really yeah. just for retail right. that they really like to have like yeah. a beautiful package. Um, and yeah, I think your guys' packaging is, it's unbelievable. Like I, I, w- I want to just like, you know, just admire it because it's, it's, it's just done so well. Um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, so then after you guys package it, it goes in a fridge, I'm guessing. Yes. And then yes. from there it goes, the next day it goes to delivery or how is the kind of deliveries usually work? Correct. Our goal is to try and get it 24 hours from, from the time of harvest, probably even lesser. Yep. So the next morning it, it's either picked up or we go drop it off. Yep. Okay, nice. And how long does you do two deliveries a week or one? Uh, we do two deliveries a week. Um, and the shelf life on most of them is 14 days. Nice. Uh, the only one I would say is uh, less than 14 days is basil. Basil lasts like yeah. typically seven to eight days if you refrigerate it. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, basil's, I wish I wish basil lasted long. Do you have any, uh, whenever I did testing with arugula, I found the shelf life was tough on that. How do you find the shelf life on the arugula compared to like a kale or broccoli? I don't think we found it like very different from the other brassicas. But now that you mention it, I, I would probably make a more careful observation to see okay. if it's the same yeah it could have just been my experience I, like we never sold it commercially so um we don't have as much yeah expertise in it as you guys do um but uh yeah that that's that's awesome that you get that that kind of shelf life um i think it's really important for especially for retailers yes. to have a really good shelf life because they don't want to lose yep. uh, on the product as much as they can so having that high amount of days shelf life on across the board really helps um obviously with the exception of basil because there's i've i've tried there's there's nothing yeah, to do about you, basil you cannot yeah. do anything yeah. yeah so then from here um you have the trays that have just the soil left and the crop is is packaged yes. um from there where does the soil go uh we dump them in big boats that are taken away by a company called black earth so they basically make compost. So they withheld to take it away at this yeah. point, and then they convert it to compost in the cellar. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. yeah it, once you get to scale, like you guys are, it's really important to have a way to yeah. remove the soil off site. Obviously, when you're at home, you can put in your garden or yeah. you know send it to the city compost. But once you're in a commercial facility, yeah. you can't just put a pile of soil. You know, in the in the back of the building, and just hope yeah. for the best. Like it's got to go somewhere. So I'm glad you guys found a solution for that. Yeah. Um. And I think I think that's pretty much it. Um. And uh, but it would be great to hear about. Um. You guys have a campaign going on to to raise money for um a tray washer to get for your staff and for yourselves to make life a lot easier because washing trays for me personally was my least favorite part yeah. of of running a microgreens farm, and I think for a lot of people the same thing. So you guys are actually raising money to purchase a tray washer. So I'd love to hear more about that and share that with everyone. Yeah, definitely. We um, So, you know, I want to mention, like, as you said, nobody likes washing trays. And we've had a lot of, um, like, staff, like, leave as well uh, because it's nobody's, you know, nobody's favorite thing to do. We do have um, some staff that has been very, very reliable. Uh, But what we hope to achieve is a lot more consistency in the washing and sanitation uh, that will, you know, basically make a huge impact on crop quality. Uh, So we are raising a crowdfunding. We are crowdfunding with the help of a nonprofit. Uh, They're called Massachusetts Growth Capital Corp. Um, And we are raising $12,563 with them. And... Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to match it one is to two. So they're going to match uh, approximately 24,000. Uh, so as long as we crowdfund 12,000, they'll match 24. And then we can put the whole amount towards a tray washer. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And if uh, I'll, I'll put the link for that in the, the video notes. And uh, I think it ends uh, no on next. November 14th. November 14th. Yeah. So if anyone is watching this and has the ability to help uh, Giant Gorilla Greens 
get their tray washer, it, it would definitely be uh, super helpful for them. And um, yeah, and they're they're leading the way in a lot of a lot of different things with uh, microgreens farming. So it's great to um, to support local farmers and and make their lives a little bit easier because farming is is tough work. It's really hard, and having a tray washer <laughs> makes life so much easier. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it was great to 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 do this tour and and see your farm. I think this is really really great, and I'm excited to uh, share this with everyone. And yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Jonah. Thank you for coming down and being with us. Yep. Talking about your experience and helping us over the years. Uh, yep. Go to where we are right now. Awesome. Yeah. I get a lot of satisfaction from it. So the pleasure is all mine. Thanks, guys. Thank you.